Uh, welcome to our Bible study on the book of Daniel. We are beginning today a study of the book of Daniel, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through, and uh, beginning today, uh, the first Sunday in January of 2019, we're going to go through, and for the next several weeks, uh, 12 to be exact, we're going to go through and we're going to take uh, one Sunday morning and we're going to preach a chapter from the book of Daniel. You realize there are 12 chapters in the book of Daniel, so it's going to take us about 12 weeks to get through this study. And so what we're going to be doing today as we begin our study in the book of Daniel uh, is we're going to be giving some background information to the book of Daniel, and then we're going to actually go in and we're going to uh, go through verse by verse what we find in Daniel chapter 1. But I do want to begin uh, with a reading of Daniel 1 beginning in verse number 1. Daniel 1, beginning in verse number 1. Uh, Daniel writes, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. When we begin this study of the book of Daniel, uh, we really need to lay some of the foundations that are going to lead up to what we just read in the book of Daniel. Uh, what we find in the book of Daniel is, as we just read, a foreign nation uh, led by a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who was king of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, you remember that prior to this, the Assyrians had kind of been the uh, ones that were most antagonistic toward the children of God. But you remember in about 606 B.C. at the Battle of Carchemish, uh, Babylon actually uh, wins the war with Assyria, and Babylon now begins to rise as a world power. And so what happens in the book of Daniel is you're going to see that Daniel and his companions are going to be carried away captive out of Jerusalem, and they are going to be taken to Babylon. Uh, they're going to be taken to the the capital of Babylon. Uh, uh, of course, when you think about the capital of Babylon, we're all familiar with the city of Nineveh. And so they're going to be taken there, and they're going to be in this land for 70 years. And we know that they're in this captivity in Babylon for 70 years because the prophet Jeremiah, and uh, I encourage you to open in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because you have not heard my words, now remember that what Jeremiah is doing is Jeremiah is prophesying prior to, at this point, the captivity, and he's warning the children of Israel if they don't change their ways. Now Jeremiah is writing at a time when they've still got time to repent and change their ways. By the time we come to Daniel, Daniel's going to be taken into captivity and it's going to be too late for anything to change. But now Jeremiah is writing and he's telling the children of Israel, you better straighten up because God is going to allow, if you don't, God is going to allow this foreign king, Nebuchadnezzar, this foreign army from Babylon, they're going to come in and they're going to take captive the city and the nation of Israel. And so because they were unwilling to do this, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 25 and verse number 9, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Now it's interesting that here is a foreign king, an ungodly king, and yet God is going to use him uh, to bring about circumstances that God wants to have. And so 
he says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. It says in verse number 11, Jeremiah 25 and verse 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So we find out that because of the rebellion of the children of Israel, that God is going to send them into Babylonian captivity, according to Jeremiah 25 and verse 11, as well as other passages in the book of Jeremiah. You might uh, notice that in, God made basically the same prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 29, that the children of Israel are going to be carried away into Babylonian captivity, and they're going to be there for 70 years. Now, this is a punishment that God has brought upon them in part because of uh, the children of Israel constantly denying the God that brought them out of the land of Egypt and following after idols. Uh, this is going to plague the nation of Israel for a number of years. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you're going to find that almost immediately when the children of Israel leave the Egyptian bondage under Moses' leadership and go in to conquer the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, that even in that time, uh, as they've just been delivered by God by a very powerful way, they're going to return to the idolatry that they knew. You remember in Exodus chapter 32, uh, the story and when I say story, I'm not talking about a made-up story. I'm talking about a uh, revelation of history. But the story of the children of Israel, they've just left Egyptian bondage. God is delivering the law of Moses to them. And immediately they go into idolatry. The Bible says in Exodus 32 in verse number 1, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want or know not what is become of him. And Aaron, of course, said to them in verse 2, Break off uh, the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters. Bring them unto me. And the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, brought them to Aaron. Verse 4, He received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of of the land of Egypt. Verse 5 says, When Aaron saw it, he built the altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Verse 6, and of course, uh, Paul is going to quote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 7. But he says, They rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So the children of Israel had a constant history of forsaking God and turning to idols. Of course, we know the story of what happened with the golden calf. As we study through the history of the children of Israel, we find uh, that uh, repeatedly they go into idolatry. And what God is going to do with uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon and the captivity of Babylon, he's going to break the children of Israel from serving idols. After the children of Israel return from this Babylonian captivity, they don't have a problem with idolatry anymore. God broke them of bowing down and worshiping these idols. So so with those thoughts before us, let's let's do a little bit of more background. Daniel whom we're going to read in just a moment. By the way, Daniel is uh, a unique book in many ways. One of the ways that it's unique, starting in chapter 2 and going through chapter 6, the end of chapter 6, 
uh, the book of Daniel is going to be written not in Hebrew but Aramaic. So it's a bilingual book, uh, which makes it very unusual. As a matter of fact, there's going to be some other languages scattered in a little bit. So, so this is a multilingual book, uh, and it makes it very unique. But Daniel was a contemporary with two other great prophets. He was contemporary with Jeremiah, and he was also contemporary with Ezekiel, both prophets that wrote books that we find in what we call the major prophets. You've got the major prophets, of course, beginning with Isaiah. You've got Isaiah. You've got Jeremiah. Of course, you've got Jeremiah writing the book of Lamentations. You've got the book of Ezekiel and the book of Daniel. So those are the five books of the major prophets. But Jeremiah prophesied in Jerusalem before Babylon took the nation, he continued to prophesy during the Babylonian exile. Now, Ezekiel, who's also, as we said a moment ago, a contemporary of Daniel and Jeremiah, Ezekiel prophesied in Babylon among the exiles. Uh, he was called the country prophet, while Daniel prophesied in the capital city of uh, Nineveh in Babylon, so he's more of a city prophet, if you want to use those terminologies. So you've got Ezekiel scattered out among with the exiles that are out farming and working, and you've got Daniel and his companions in the capital city of Babylon. And you remember that in about uh, 612, the capital city of Assyria, Nineveh, falls. And it becomes now uh, a part of the Babylonian Empire. And so in around 606 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar wins the Battle of Carchemish. He starts becoming a worldwide ruler. He comes in and he takes Daniel and about 10,000 of the children of Israel uh, into captivity. By the way, as we read a moment ago in verse number 1 of Daniel chapter 1, Jehoiakim, who's king of Judah, also called Jeconiah or Coniah, uh, he also was taken into this Babylonian captivity. But that happens. The first wave of captives are taken in 606 B.C. You remember a second wave is going to be taken into Babylon about 597 B.C., and then in 586 B.C., Jerusalem completely falls. The temple is going to be restored. That happens about 586 B.C. And so Daniel is a part of that first wave of captives. And so in the book of Daniel, specifically Daniel chapters 1 through 6, we're going to see the history of Daniel in this captivity. And you remember that Daniel survives the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. He's taken captive as a young man. Uh, he survives that 70 years. He then becomes uh, a part of the captivity of the Medes and the Persians. And ultimately, he's going to see the Grecian Empire come to rise. Daniel's going to see all of that. And then beginning in Daniel chapter 7 and going through Daniel chapter 12, Daniel's going to relate a series of about four visions that he has during this time frame that we're talking about, uh, during this captivity, the rise, of, the rise of the Medes and the Persians, the rise of the Greeks, uh, Daniel's going to have these visions that are going to be very similar. As a matter of fact, they're going to have the same exact thing as the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has in uh, Daniel chapter 2, which we'll study uh, next week. And so this is a little bit of the background. You remember that uh, in 586, as we said a moment ago, Jerusalem is completely taken and destroyed. The temple is destroyed. And then in about 536 B.C., about approximately 50 years later, Babylon is going to fall to the Medes and Persians. And then about 10 years uh, after, or excuse me, about 11 years after that, as we mentioned a moment ago, uh, there's going to be a second group of the children of Israel that are going to be allowed to return to Israel. 
And then in 447 BC, a third group are going to be allowed to return to Jerusalem. And so what we find in the book of Daniel, and by the way, Daniel is a great book. There's been a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of false teaching that have come from uh, people uh, misapplying what we read in the book of Daniel. So as we go through these 12 lessons, we're not only going to be looking at the book verse by verse, but we're also going to uh, incorporate some of the false doctrines that have arisen uh, by those who would misapply the book of Daniel. And so that's all going to take place as we go through this most fascinating book. I want to also point out that Daniel is the writer of the book. Uh, this is vitally important because there have been some, uh, because of the so precise, Daniel in his uh, visions is so precise, he's even going to name the names of men that are going to arise to a place of prominence before those men are ever born. And so it's fascinating. And so what happens is people say, well, Daniel could not have made those prophecies and been so precise and so correct. And so they would argue, because they don't believe in the inspiration of the Bible, they would argue that the book of Daniel was actually written after these events took place. That uh, Daniel is not the writer at all. That it was some other man uh, that wrote these after these events transpired. Well, that's not true, folks. Daniel is the writer of the book. And, and I want to make a distinction right here so we understand what I'm talking about. When I say Daniel wrote the book, God is the author. God used his Holy Spirit to inspire Daniel to record exactly and precisely not only the events of his life, Daniel chapters 1 through 6, but the visions that Daniel had where Daniel is actually looking sometimes 600 years into the future and being very precise. So those that are antagonistic to the Bible that want to claim the Bible's just a book, they say Daniel couldn't have done that. Well, what they don't realize is that Daniel is writing by the inspiration of God. So God's the author of the book. Daniel is just the penman that God chose. And so we're going to see the life of Daniel, and we're going to see in Daniel chapter 2 how Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he, and he doesn't remember the dream. He doesn't know what it means. So Daniel's going to interpret that dream, tell him what the dream was, tell him what it means. And he's going to say in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, which we'll study next week, what he's going to do in Daniel chapter 2 is he's going to tell Nebuchadnezzar about this dream that he had. He's going to interpret the dream. And what Daniel is going to say, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not getting ahead of myself. I'm laying a foundation of what we'll see next week. But what Daniel is going to do is he's going to say there are going to be four earthly kingdoms that are going to arise to a place of prominence. He's going to say, first of all, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to rise to be the head of gold in that statue that he saw in Daniel chapter 2. And then he's going to see the rise of the Medes and Persians. Then he's going to see the rise of the Grecian Empire, ultimately led by Alexander the Great, and then split off into four different kingdoms after Alexander dies. And then he's going to see the rise of the Roman Empire. And Daniel says in Daniel chapter 2 in verse number 44, that in the days of these kings, that's the Roman kings, you've got to read the context, and we'll break it down next week and show it very clearly. But in the days of the Roman kings, Daniel 2 and verse 44, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So there are five kingdoms that are revealed in Daniel chapter 2. Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, but there's going to be a fifth kingdom. That is the kingdom of heaven. That is the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Going to be established in the days of the Roman kingdom. That's all for next week. 
But it says, In the days of these kings, Daniel 2 and verse 44, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, listen to this, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces, consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So Daniel makes a prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 about five kingdoms. Only one of those kingdoms will endure, endure for all eternity. That's the kingdom of heaven, the church of Christ, built by Jesus Christ, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the head of that church. Well, that's a little bit for what's in store. But let's turn our attention now back to Daniel chapter 1. And what we're going to see in Daniel chapter 1 is, first of all, the captives and their training. And then we're going to see Daniel and his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their commitment to remain undefiled by all that the king has to offer. So let's pick up in Daniel 1 in verse number 3. The king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs. And, I, and I'll come back to talk about that in just a moment, the master of the eunuchs. That he should bring, we're in verse 3 of Daniel 1, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. Verse 4 said, Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Listen to Daniel 1 and verse 6. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Listen to verse 7. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and of Mishael, uh, Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Now we know the other three more by their Babylonian name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But I want you to notice what it says in verse 7. That unto whom the prince of the eunuch gave names. Now, friends, it's a sad thing, but it's true that God punished these kings because of their open rebellion to him. And I want you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah. And I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 39. Isaiah chapter 39. And, and I want you to listen to what we find in Isaiah 39. And it says in verse number 1, At that time Meredith Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the precious ointments, and all the house of his armor and all that was found in the treasure. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto king Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. And then he said, What have they seen in thine house? Now I'm going to pause there and just point out what a fabulous sermon. What have they seen in your house? That's a penetrating question that we all ought to ask ourselves. What do people see in our house? Do they see godliness? Do they see kindness? Do they see us producing the fruit of the Spirit? Or do they see anger and harshness and bitterness and drunkenness and all kinds of... What do they see in your house? But anyway, Isaiah said to Hezekiah, What have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, All that is in my house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of the host. Behold, the days come that in all thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, listen to this, shall be carried to Babylon, 
Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Listen to verse 7. And thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away. Now listen. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. What a short-sighted man. He's only glad that there's going to be peace in his day. He doesn't... Folks, I can't even understand this. He doesn't even bat an eye that because of his wickedness that his family is going to be ultimately some of them killed, some of them made into eunuchs, and they're going to go into servitude. And as we said a moment ago from the book of Jeremiah that they're going to be there for 70 years in Babylon. I read that because Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are made eunuchs. Now, I'm not going to try to be overly graphic in in what that is, but you all realize if you're of any level of maturity at all that a eunuch is someone who has the inability because sometimes of birth, uh, because of sometimes because they've said themselves that they're not going to participate in sexual acts or someone uh, makes them a eunuch so they have no ability to perform in a sexual way. So you think about these three young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think about them being taken captive. Think about them as they're in the city of Jerusalem, descendants of royalty, and they see this foreign nation come in. No doubt they saw many of their own people slaughtered, maybe even some of their own household slaughtered right before their eyes. Then they're, they're castrated and taken into Babylonian captivity. And yet these men, even though they're youth at this point, and they're going to go through some mighty trials, they're going to remain faithful to God. What a powerful testimony that, as the Apostle Paul said, it doesn't matter what state I'm in, I've learned therewith to be content. Daniel exemplifies that statement. So, the captive's training They're going to be trained so that they can stand before the king Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. So now let's go to Daniel chapter 1 verses 8 through 21. The commitment of these four young men to not defile themselves with all that the king of this ungodly foreign nation has to offer. It says in verse 8 of chapter 1, Daniel. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So let's notice what happens. Daniel purposes in his heart. Friends, that's where it all starts. It starts in the the heart, the mind of man. And Daniel and his three companions said, Look, The king's going to bring out all this uh, meat. Now remember the children of Israel, Daniel and his companions live under the law of Moses. And under the law of Moses, they were not to eat anything that Moses had taught. They could not eat anything that was unclean. So now the king lays out before them this great feast for them to eat of. No doubt there was pork, seafood, all kinds of things, things that they were not allowed to eat under the law of Moses. There's no indication that the other 10,000 or so didn't just dive right in and eat it. But Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we're not going to defile ourselves with this king's meat. We're not going to drink his wine. So Daniel and those men call for the prince of eunuchs. Verse number 9, now God had brought, Daniel 1 and verse 9, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse uh, liking than the children which are of your sort? 
then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. He said, Daniel, not only are you going to get into trouble, not only Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but my head's on the line too. So verse 11, Daniel said to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Verse 12, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse or, or uh, uh, kind of like grits or, or uh, oatmeal. Give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Verse 13, Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented unto them in this matter and proved them ten days. Verse 15, At the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portions of the king's meat. Thus, verse 16, Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. Now listen to verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said that he should bring them in, then the prince, prince of the eunuch brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king in an all manner of wisdoms, uh, and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of the king of Cyrus. So what a fascinating way to introduce the book of Daniel. And as we've already said, we're going to now begin going through this book chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2 and Nebuchadnezzar's dream and, and Daniel telling him the dream and interpreting. We're going to see in Daniel chapter 3 how uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even though they're commanded to bow down and worship an idol, they're not going to change one bit. They're not going to bow. They're not going to bend. And they're not going to burn. And God saves them. We're going to see in Daniel chapter 4 that Daniel has... Uh, or Nebuchadnezzar has another vision. He doesn't understand it. And Daniel's going to tell him that the point of this vision in Daniel 4 and verse 17 is that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth over it even the basis of men. We're going to see in Daniel chapter 5 will Belshazzar uh, gets drunk and uses the, the vessels that had been brought into captivity from the children of Israel and he's going to toast the wines uh, or, or the gods of wine silver gold and all these things and he's going to see the handwriting on the wall and then we're going to see Daniel and Daniel chapter 6 go into that lion's den and God raising him up and giving him triumph and then we're going to begin in Daniel chapter 7 and see the visions that Daniel has so, friends, that's what we've got outlined for us. People, that's what we're going to be doing. I hope you'll uh, enjoy these studies. I hope they'll be beneficial. And as we always do, we want to remind you that uh, God wants you to be saved, and he's done everything that he can to help you to be saved. He's given us a book, and, and it, it's a book that can only be uh, understood as a book from God himself. And he's going to tell us about his love, his mercy, his grace. And he's going to tell us that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. And that we can have remission of sins if we'll be obedient, as Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9 tell us. That Jesus, even though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things which he suffered. And he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So if you're willing to obey Jesus Christ, do you hear the word of God? Romans 10 and verse 17, you believe that word, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. You repent of the sins that you have in your life, uh, Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. You confess Jesus as the Christ, Matthew 10 and verse 32, and you're baptized for the remission of your sins. And so, friends, we've got an outstanding group of lessons coming. I'm not saying that because I'm preaching it. I'm saying that because it comes from God. And so, friends, that's what we've got in store for us. Let's study the Word of God together. See you next week as we go to Daniel chapter 2.